thousand psi, we're using the loads in keps here. Lowercase a, we do not know what that is. This is the way to calculate it. And where do we get 14? Make a note of it. 14 is the width of that beam. All right, so capital C, the, um, that comes out to be 35.7 A. A is an unknown. Big T is 180. These two forces are equal. So in, on page 22, I am reiterating that T has to be equal to C for equilibrium. Therefore, 180 is equal to 35.7 times A, and there it is. We can calculate A. Guys, this is the only way that we can calculate that, the value of A. And what is A again? The depth of the square block. Is everyone with me so far? Let's continue. The next thing that we want to do, remember, we are trying to find the nominal moment. And the nominal moment is nothing other than the moment that this force couple creates. So we need to know the distance. What is the distance between the two force couples? Always, always, it's equal to d minus a over 2. And this is why it's important that we calculate the value of a. And I just showed you how we can calculate the value of a. Substitute it in here, d minus a over 2. The other thing that I've told you, but I want to men make mention of it again, d is the distance from the compression side, the top side, to where the bar is reinforcing, the, the center of the reinforcing bar. All right? So that's D. That's why we're using 21. Once we get that moment arm, then it's easy to calculate the nominal moment. Nominal moment would be equal to either the large T or the large C, because they're equal, multiplied by the moment arm. Please pay attention. It comes out to be in terms of inch caps, because those are the units we've been using. And then you can make a conversion factor and come up with foot caps. Now, you may ask, uh, do I need to just leave it in, in terms of inch caps? Do I need to convert it to foot caps? Or what do I do? Well, the answer is, look at the answers that they have and look at the units that they use in their answers. And that is the, the units that your answers need to uh, be related to. OK. Here is a, uh, a problem. It's a cross-section of a, of a beam. Uh, let's do this problem together. Um, it says there are three number eight bars, three number eight bars. So either calculate the area of a number eight bar or look it up in a table. A sub S, total area of the steel is 2.37 inches. The width is given to be 14 inches. The overall depth is 24 inches. Remember, you only use that if it is uncracked. You only use that if you are finding the gross area. However, D, which is important, is given to be 21 inches. And once again, that's measured from the compression side to where the steel is located. Now, um, what you see here, this is a strain diagram. All, well, I will not spend too much time on it, but I will explain to you what that shows. That shows, that shows the strain at different locations. And, and by the way, one thing that I want you to do so you will understand this, this uh, relationship, that actually, the point zero zero three should be here. 0 0.003 is um, uh, 
um, what happens at the, the, the top of the concrete. And then this side here, This side here, this line, should be located where the steel is. All right. So basically, that triangle would be down here. But what this is showing is the relationship between the strains. And do you remember, we talked about 0 0.003. The significance of the 0 0.003 was that we assumed, or ACI assumes, if the strain in concrete reaches 0 0.003, we have reached uh, failure. All right? Or I shouldn't say failure. It, it, it reaches the ultimate value that we allow it to reach. All right? Now, if the strain in the concrete is 0 0.003, then the strain at the steel level would be this. Just note that equation. And we use that. We identified it using um, uh, similar triangles. All right? All right, let's do this problem together. For problem number three, the one we just looked at, the previous slide, keep those dimensions in front of you. It says determine the value of A. Again, what is A? Guys, I know you may be tired, and what we were, ta we were uh, talking about may not seem that exciting to you, but um, I need your attention for another uh, 40 minutes, OK? So we've got some time to go. Let's see. I want everybody to calculate this. Uh, the solution is given to you, but let's see if we can do it. Determine values of A. We need to find A. Then find C, and then epsilon T, that equation that I just showed to you. Now, 60,000 PSI is the yield stress of the steel, and 3,000 PSI is F prime C, compressive strength. The equations that I've shown you, what do we do? Well. You draw that uh, sketch. The stress is 0.85 F prime C. Draw the stress block. Calculate big C, which is the compressive force. Write it down. It's always the same. 0.85 times F prime C times little a times little b. B is the width. Next thing. T, big T. What is that? Always, always is equal to AS, total area of the steel, times FY, yield of the steel. The next thing that you do, big C, set it equal to big T. And that, guys, is exactly what I have here. If you, if you set those two equal to each other, A is the unknown you calculated. All right? So A is 3.98. If you don't get that value, please, please go back and refer to this problem and, and, and do it later. All right? So small a, depth of the stress block, as Donald says, is 3.98. Now, what's beta 1 for this case? Beta 1, remember, by definition, 0.85 if, if, uh, the concrete is less than 4,000 PSI. So in this case, it's 3,000, so beta 1 is uh, 0.85. Now, remember, we calculated A, but the problem says, can you find C? C is the distance between the top to the centroid. There it is. Remember, A, small a, is equal to C times beta 1. So if you know what A is, you can simply find there it is. Then, if we calculate the epsilon in the steel, 
that is the equation that I showed you on uh, on two slides ago. Uh, I told you we we identified it using um, similar triangles. So epsilon t is the strain in the steel. You may ask me why why are we concerned about the strain in the steel? Well, there's a very important point here, and uh, and it's a very interesting point. So let me ask you, if you were the designer, I want every one of you to think about this. If you were the designer of this concrete section, would you want, if, if it reaches actual failure, hopefully it won't, but if it does, would you want the concrete section to fail first or would you want the steel to fail first? Think about it. And Arash, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking me. Uh, I know what, what, I, what you're saying, but uh, uh, Arash is saying um, he would prefer the steel to fail first. Um, then Kenneth says no. He wants concrete to uh, first fail. Uh, Christopher says, we want to make sure the steel reinforcing yields before concrete fails. All right. All right, guys. Ryan says, steel, we want steel to fail because it will yield and give us warning before it fails. And that is, all of you, most of you said it correctly, those of you who said steel. All right. And Ryan also offered the, the answer in a very simple way. So I want everybody to pay attention. When we design a reinforced concrete section, we want, we want to force the section, dimension it such that steel will fail first. And that is because I told you before the difference between uh, ductile materials and, and brittle materials. Steel is a ductile material, so if that reaches uh, its yield stress, then it will give us some warning before it fails. If concrete fails first, it will just, it's a brittle failure and will give us no warning. All right? So, Yeah, Mary Hill says if the steel is, is hidden in, in the concrete uh, wall uh, and it fails, uh, um, how would that help us? Well, think about it, uh, Mary. If, uh, if the steel is inside a concrete wall but it reaches yield, it is going to go through some appreciable change in dimension and deformation. And that deformation will cause spalling of the concrete. And if, if you're occupying that building, if you're in a room where the wall starts moving because of uh, a major sag, as Donald is uh, mentioning, uh, then, then you know there's something going on. And you're not going to stand around uh, to see what happens. You get out of the building. Now, the building we will, we will not save, but the people using the, the building uh, we save. And that's the uh, issue of ductility, all right? So um, that's why the designers would like to have ductility in their design. So how does this connect to what we're doing? Well, what we're going to do is in order to decide whether the steel fails or the concrete fails first, we need to know the strain that's produced in each, either in concrete or steel, 
at the time that it fails. 